So I'm just going to finish up life cycle of a church. Remember we talked about last time how history and the scriptures and prophecy, they are what? <laughs> The prophecy is, is, is a repeating pattern. Repeat, yeah, yeah repeating, repeating pattern. pattern. That's the word I wanted. Yeah, is yeah. A repeating pattern. Yeah, is <laughs> a repeating pattern. We talked about and we showed a lot of examples like John and first John was at seventeen, chapter two, seventeen says that you've heard that the Antichrist is coming, as many antichrists have arisen. So you go down through history and see a lot of fulfillments of the Antichrist. Probably because Hitler, right? I mean, here's Hitler, a guy who was anti-Semitic, tried to exterminate the Jews, and you couldn't buy or sell without the mark, the German mark, their money. <laughs> so if we're living during that time, we'd probably say, yeah, Hitler's the Antichrist. <laughs> well, he was a type of fulfillment along the way, and so that got to like the early church. Word. They had church buildings and cathedrals and big glass stained windows right, right, right from the very start. Is that correct? No. No? no? Did they? Oh no! <laughs> what, what did they have? Not yeah, house churches. House churches. Yes, like two forty six. They uh, met from house to house, and there's several scriptures that says like, "Into Vicky Wafer and the church in her house, whatever." <laughs> right? And that's the way they met mm -hmm. because they couldn't afford it. But that concept didn't even come to them, and so that's what I really like about this. And so I just think. Now, I was looking at trying to find stats. Most of the stats are old, where they talk about, like, you know, by 15 years, where the denominational churches have gone way down. In fact, the home church movement, and this stat is like two day, decades old, is, is bigger than any Protestant denomination. And that's with them not even, and I don't know how you count that, because they're not registered. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So I guess it's a guesstimation or whatever, the ones they know about. It's the biggest, it was between the Southern Baptists church and the Catholic church, you know, so it's growing, it's really growing, so it's going back to the house, and I think that's where it's going to end up, and so life cycle of a church, and this I got, this is not for me, this is from a sermon by Chuck Missler, and so I actually wrote this down, and here's the cycle of a church, number one, you start off with a people-oriented, okay, pastor, Things. So, and that, you have a small home group, fellowship, and everything, the emphasis is on the people, okay, and there's a lot of interpersonal relationships, all right, which is good. Number two, then you go to a pulpit oriented, okay, um, pastor phase, where now what happens is most of the interaction is from the pulpit to the people, and there's less interaction, okay? And interactive things going on, because it maybe it starts to grow. Then, number three, and this really is, I've been in churches where I see go through the phases, mm -hmm. and, stuff. and it doesn't mean that as the church goes, that because the pastor's up there talking more, that, it, that that's not a bad thing, Just okay? Growing. Yeah, it's growing, and these things in and of themselves, until you get to the end, are not bad. And you get into the property phase. Oh, we need to get our property, right? Oh, gosh. And then the funds start get channeling where? Not into the people, into the building. Now, is it wrong for a church to have a building? No. No. There's nothing. So nothing is inherently evil. This is just what it goes through. And you can see the phases, okay, as they go. And then the structure within the church becomes more business-like and different structures of organization start to appear. A flow chart, like at the labs, I got my uh, group flow chart, you know, who's where and who's under and then who's under them and all that stuff, okay? Then, from there, you go into the power phase, okay? And this is where the organization becomes well-defined structurally, okay? People seek to go up to different levels, it's almost like a corporation, right? They seek to go up to different levels, and the pastor becomes more like a CEO than a shepherd. Okay, have you guys ever experienced that? Oh, yeah. Okay, and again, there's nothing wrong with an organization 
because our God is a God of order, all right? Mm -hmm. So as things grow big, so again, I'm not saying, hey, once they have a, you know, some kind of structure, that's bad. No, I'm not saying that. This is just the natural life of the church is just going to happen. Okay, and then number five, they all have to be P's. Right? They do that, you know, my three-point sermon, and they all start with S or P's or whatever. The political decay phase. That's where it's politically div driven by different factions, and people are vying for power and stuff, and then, which is unfortunate. But that's kind of the life cycle of a church. So just because a church is organized or has a building doesn't make it evil or bad or anything like that. As it starts to grow and you start, what you start doing is adopting more man-made methods. And that's why it becomes more like a, a corporation yep. with a CEO as opposed to biblically being a shepherd and everybody caring. You, you just have to go to where the spirit is. I mean, if you go to where the next exciting thing is or whatever, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. You're going to go here, then you're going to go over there. You just need to go where God has you to go, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of the uh, the thing that happens. So, someone had a question? Bill. Bill. I'm just going to make a comment. Yeah, it's yes. so true because we have seen that all of a sudden there's more emphasis on the corporation yes. than there is a church. Mm -hmm. And yes. all of a sudden the pastor becomes president of the corporation and, and all you're hearing about is the corporation, the corporation, the corporation. Mm -hmm. And you're kind of wondering, mm -hmm. where does the church go? The church learns more from the culture, society, and the world than it does the Word of God. Yeah, it's yeah. true. That's where we take our models. That's where we take our cues. And I'm trying to think of uh, some real big entrepreneur guy, Peter uh, Drucker. Peter Drucker, that's it. And he influenced like the Rick Warrens and all this. Mm -hmm. And then I even got a YouTube video where they asked him, are you Christian? No, I never considered myself a Christian. He wasn't even a Christian. Oh. And he was teaching them how to have mega churches because it was all marketing. Yeah. Yeah. It was all marketing. Yeah. I could care less about marketing. In fact, my fear is that we outgrow this living room. We'll just open the doors for the portal, but that's it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and especially now that we get But I could, you know, the mega church where you go in and hide and just listen to a sermon then leave. I mean, you might as well just stay home and listen to like YouTube because mm -hmm. they have better sermons there. Yeah. You know. So now every time I erase the board, someone gets mad. Can I erase it? <laughs> yes. I just wanted to say something. Yes. This is something that's always boggling my mind because. The Acts Church is amazing. Yes. Read that. Mm -hmm. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. Bill, Bill's no, just messing with you. Okay, okay, okay. okay. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. Yes. The Acts Church is amazing, and yes. you read about it, and people are just getting baptized on the spot, and speaking yep. in tongues, and prophesying, yeah. and singing so loud at a prison that the prison walls just yes. crumbling down, yep. and then saving the prison guard that's beating them, you know, and Yes. You hear stories like this, and That's they, the were, I they were operating out of a house church, yep. out of these small communities. Exactly. And then, you know, the Christians started to follow the ways of the world and the patterns of the world, adopting their holidays, their pagan holidays, adopting their lifestyles so that they could avoid being killed in the Colosseums, I guess. Amen. But, you know, we were so infiltrated into pagan Roman society that there's just no way to really even differentiate anymore. So we talked well, about remember the on um, Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 24. See, I told you everything in advance. He's telling us things ahead of time. Does anybody so know that we know that he's in complete control yeah. and that he's it's got the original thing. Hebrew. You don't have to freak out like a war oh, Yeah, no. But then Can you imagine being a changed man. Huh. My out. gosh, I, mean, I, I couldn't even fathom that. Israel. In fact, be a like in this world? one of their months is called, get this, Tammuz. <gasps> yeah, one of their months is called Tammuz. <laughs> and they got that from Babylon. They got these from the foreign nations. In fact, of all the days and months, God only names one with a name. He called, he called it first month, second month, third month, you know, 12th mm -hmm. month, first day, second. <clears throat> What's the only month or day that he names? The Sabbath. The Sabbath. Mm -hmm. Exactly. It's those other names come from pagan cultures. Okay, so don't think they come from the Bible or from God. But he just uses those names because that's what they were using. Mm -hmm. Okay, so 
When we look at this, I'll just give a quick little, uh, remember a guy named Yona? Mm -hmm. Okay, and if we look at his thing in, a, in the pictograph, okay, Yod is like, oh, I gotta do some so trouble right here. Okay, that's an mm -hmm. arm. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a hand, okay? Mm -hmm. And then you have the vol, which is a V, but if it's a dot above, it makes a long O sound, okay? And that's like a hook. Okay, or something you add two things together. The noon kind of looks like this. It could mean a seed or it could mean a fish. And then the hay is, believe it or not, it's a guy going like this. Like he's going, wow. Yeah. Okay? <laughs> so, what is, I, I just did this one Wednesday evening while we we're doing the book of Jonah, and I thought, I wonder what that means. And it floored me. Okay? If you look at it, it means yo, that's the first name. His first name, there's a deed or a work. It represents a deed or a work. And then this ball is a hook. It, in fact, it's translated and. It hooked two, two things together. It means there's a work to be done. And when you add a fish, that's what that represents, people behold it. Does that sound like Jonah? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Story of Jonah, right, is in his name. It's like, how did that happen? So he had something to do, and when God added that fish into his life, he was able to reveal it, okay? Um, we talked about, you know, this is Av, um, which is the, the, the uh, first one is the Aleph, and that's an oxen, right? Strength, mm -hmm. okay? And then the uh, B, or Vet, is like a uh, floor plan. It's like the floor plan for a house. It's a strong, the ox represents strength in the leader. It's the strong leader of the house. That's what Father means. Mm -hmm. The strong leader of the house. It's like, wow. Mm -hmm. You start going through all this and it's like, really? Now my favorite one. And I hope you guys remember this one. This is the most amazing one. But I'm going to write it in Hebrew up here and you guys better know what it is. <laughs> okay? Am I asking too much? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Come on. That's Anybody recognize that move? Close. In fact, I got it around my neck. So I get to cheat. No, it's a Yod He Vav He, which is. Yes, the name of God. Yod He Vav He. We just have these consonants in the Bible, okay? So what is the Paleo Hebrew mean of that? So remember, this one is like. Um, this one is that the yod, it means, it's actually the picture of a hand or an arm, okay? Remember this one? It means to behold. The hay, and it's right here too. Okay, the vav is, it's a connecting thing, it's a long stake or nail. Okay, so what does it mean? It's saying the hand, behold it. The nail, behold it. Or behold the nailed hand. In the name of God. Yes, crucifixion. Behold the nailed hand. Now that, <laughs> I know. It's like, really? Yeah, in the Paleo Hebrew, in the pictograph, behold the nailed hand. So God, because everything in the Bible, the Father was the Father's pleasure to make everything about his son. Even when the Holy Spirit comes, guess what? He didn't testify of himself. He was here to testify of Jesus. Which is why in the typology in Genesis, he's always what? Anybody know? Now this is for like a 500 points, but he's to get ready with the pen. Um, he's always an unnamed servant. Right? Unnamed servant. So... Um, it was an unnamed servant that got Rebecca for Isaac. But when we go back and find out who his head servant was, Eliezer, which means the helper. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. a real... And who got the Gentile bride for Jesus? The Holy Spirit. The helper. Through saving us. Okay? So, now, if you look at it, it's also another way. And I started fooling around with this. Meaning-wise, what does it mean? Okay? It means this. The yod means... A deed, okay, that you have, and then our work, and then of course you have behold, then you have the vol, which is unity too, because it brings things together, okay, and then it's behold. 
Okay, and so you look. It says, look at the deed, look at the unity, or look at the deed or the work that brings unity. Is what it's saying. What work would that be? The cross. What unity is talking about? Look around the room. Us. What happens in the book of Revelation? Okay? So let's look at a general outline. And Revelation is actually one of the most orderly books. In fact, in Revelation 119, he gives you the outline for the book. At <coughs> right? the things which were, the things which are, and the things which will be. You break it down three points. He just gave you the outline. Mm -hmm. Things which are are the thing are excuse me, things which were was the vision he saw and he was on Patmos. The things which are is the church age, Revelation two and three, and the things which will be is after that, the tribulation period. Okay? So Revelation one is the intro. John on Patmos, he sees the vision, right? Revelation two and three is what? The church. The, the letters to, to the, the churches, churches right? Mm -hmm. Right. And it's coded because as you look at this, there is an order to it. The letters to the seven churches. Seven represents what? Perfection. perfection. Not perfection, because Satan has seven heads. The beast has seven heads. But, but perfection in the Greek way of thinking, which means completion. completion. So when the Greeks say uh, perfection, they actually do mean completion. Okay. In some instances, it does mean perfection, obviously when it refers to God. So the letters to the seven churches, and I told you in that, they have the complete church age. Right. The complete history of the church, which I'm going to go over at the end of this study. Okay? Not not this study, right. but the whole thing. Okay? Which is going to correlate to Matthew 13 and the seven parables, and Paul wrote letters to seven churches, and there are seven feasts. They all line up. Which, that's going to be beyond coincidence, right? Right. I would think so. All right. Then, if when you get to Revelation 4, what do you see? John looks up, 4-1, he sees a doorway open in heaven, and a voice that says, come up here. And so that's the rapture typology-wise, okay? He goes up there. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying I'm pre-trip because of that one thing. I used to laugh at pre-trippers, and they told me that when I was Mr. Post-trip. Okay? Yeah, is that all you got? But once you understand it, you see that picture, okay? Then what happens in chapter 5? He sees a vision. He's actually up there in heaven. Vision of heaven, right? Mm -hmm. All right. And then, and actually, a vision of heaven. And the Lamb appears, who takes the seven sealed scroll. And that anyone know what that seven sealed scroll is? The deed to the earth. Uh, okay, Vicky, you get a hundred points. Thank you. But what else? <laughs> marriage. marriage. Yes, marriage. It, give uh, give me you no know, two hundred. All right. Okay, because okay, he came with the more usual one. And so which one is it? Both. Both. Okay, Pam gets 300. Okay? It's both because it represents Yeshua going in to conquer the land from the usurpers. What happened in the book of Joshua? Yeshua went into the land to conquer the land for his children from the usurpers, right? Same thing. And from seven nations, too. Anyways. So, you have the vision of heaven and the Lamb, and he gets to the seven scroll, and then on six, chapter six, you got the seven seals that are broken on those, okay? So, this has to occur to me in the tribulation period. We have the church age done with, John is raptured, he's up there in heaven, okay? Then you have the seven seals. So that's got to occur within that timeline, which would be in the tribulation period. So now we're going to find out where the birth pangs are. Okay? So, let's go and do that first column. Okay? Since I can't read, uh, you know, if someone wants to raise their hand and read that um, Revelation, that first column, right there. Okay, you, you see it? Revelation 6 1. Nobody else knows how to read it? I mean, okay, Jack. Go ahead. Uh, just Revelation, just down? Yeah, just that first box. Okay. Uh, first seal, Antichrist, one. And I saw the, uh, I'm sorry, and I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard as it was the noise, as it were the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, come and see. Uh, and I saw, and behold, and behold a white horse, and he sat, I'm sorry, and he that sat on him had a bow. 
and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering. Okay, and that is the Antichrist, right? We talked about some people mistaking that for the Christ because he is a reasonable facsimile of the Messiah, right? Right. So he appears that. So he's conquering with just a bow but no arrows, which means what? Peace. Yeah, without military conquest, right? Mm -hmm. He has the military might, he has the bow, but he's doing it through intrigue and other things that we talked about in Daniel 11. Okay, the Antichrist. Now let's go to Matthew 24, 4. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. So the very first thing that all of it discourse starts on is Christ. False Christ, right? Mm -hmm. What's the first seal? The Antichrist. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So let's go to Mark 13 and see what he starts off with. Verse 5, And Jesus answering them began to say, Take heed, lest any man deceive you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and shall deceive many. Oh, he's starting off with, on the Olivet Discourse, with false Christ, or Antichrist. Now let's go to Luke 21. A weird thing. How does he start his the Olivet Discourse? And he, talking about Yeshua, said, Take heed that you be not deceived, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and the time draweth near, do not go, therefore after them. So in all three all of the discourses, like the first seal, is warning about <coughs> the Antichrist, and all four talk about false Christ. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's an interesting pattern. Remembering that he's talking to the disciples and to the Jewish people. Yes. Correct. Okay. Yes, exactly. So let's go to the second seal and see if things line up. And I kept these in order of the verses, okay? Then do any switcheroonies. So, which is another technical term, theological term, switcheroonies. Okay, so let's go to the first column, Revelation 6 3. And when he opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given him that sat there to take <coughs> peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. So could we call that war? Mm -hmm. He took away the peace. Mm -hmm. A sword was given to him. So we'll call that war. Okay, let's go to the next column over, Matthew 24. The very next thing he talks about is this. And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See to that you're not troubled. For these things must take place, but the end is not. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Mm -hmm. So the next thing Christ talks about all of it, this course here, is war. Okay, that's interesting. Let's go to Mark 13 and see what the very next thing he talks about there is. Verse 7. And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. Be ye not troubled, for such things must needs be. But the end shall not be yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Now let's go to Luke 21 and see what the very next thing he talks about is. But we shall hear of wars and commotions. Be not terrified, for these things must first come to pass, but the end is not by and by. Then he said unto them, Nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. He talks about wars next. Is this a possible pattern <laughs> that can give us clues? Okay, well, let's see. Let's go to Revelation again, the third box. Okay, the third seal, which I'm going to call famine. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see, and I beheld, and lo, a black horse... <laughs> And him that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hands. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny, and see that ye do not harm the oil in the wine. In other words, if you translate it back into their time, it's going to take a full day's wages just to barely keep yourself alive. When he says don't harm the oil in the wine, that's probably a reference. It's not going to affect the rich. Because they're leaving the world and they stockpiled everything. And they had the money. Because they took it from us. Okay? So they're going to be okay. But us, we're going to struggle just to feed. You're not going to feed your family. Just to feed yourself. Not us. Is it us? Or are you talking about... No, no, about I'm sorry. Us, I'm, I'm using the okay, okay. okay. The Jews. <laughs> sorry. Because I'm, I'm just gonna, not us. Because I'm going to prove that <laughs> these things are in the tribulation period. Right. Not, not okay, now. Okay, just making okay, sure. Okay, sorry, sorry. That's okay. Sorry, sorry. Okay. Yeah, give me a minus 200. Right, now. thank you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, if I mess up, then I, I have to deduct points. Okay. Larissa has a question. Yes. Can you just explain more as to why that means the rich, the oil, and the wine? Because that's 
Oil and wine were more expensive commodities as opposed to going down to the river and drawing their own water. And wheat and barley were the most basic, substantive, you know, thing that you could have. Everybody had that. In fact, the barley was kind of the cheaper version, the inferior version. So it's saying that you're going to take a full day's wages just to have bread, just to keep yourself alive. But it's not going to harm the oil and wine, what the rich people have, because they're going to be protected. Because they protected themselves. Okay? And that's part of the reason why. Because I'm going to show you that this all happens in the first half of the tribulation. Okay? During the first three and a half years. And because of that, that's where the false prophet in Revelation 13 introduces what? The mark, mark. mark of the beast. A new economic system that's going to cure everything. All you're going to do is sell your soul to have it. That's it. Just come under allegiance because remember, where's the mark? Right on your forehead or on your back. Yeah. I think it's Zechariah 12 that talks about the idol shepherd, I D O L, which is the Antichrist. Mm -hmm. And he has a wound. A sword shall be on his arm and on his right eye, I think it is. And that's exactly where you take the marks. Because mm -hmm. it's really an identification thing, too. Mm -hmm. But it's also a thing, a tracking device, and probably something that will get into you and change your DNA. Mm -hmm. And I, the funny thing was, I got that from Chuck Missler like 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he was actually saying that 30 years ago. Yep. He was saying, like, why would God not let somebody into heaven that took the mark of the beast when they could repent? Right? Mm -hmm. If anybody repents, will God receive them? Yes. Yeah. The answer is they can't because they're not fully human anymore. It's changed their DNA. Okay? And and he was talking about technology just then being where it's like that. But again, yeah. we're in the tribulation period, and I will guarantee you we are not going to be in the tribulation period. Yeah, when I lived in the communist country, Bulgaria, I would ask the people, i say, you know, they told you you live in the most prosperous nation in the world. Did you guys believe it? And the answer was, oh no, we knew they were lying. But you couldn't, you know, say too much. And that's why when I went, like, to the biggest, the capital, Sophia, and I was on the busiest street, I was thinking, there's something wrong here. And then I realized what it was. It's like you're watching the TV and someone turned up the volume. There's all these people around you, and you usually hear mumble or talking or whatever. Mm -hmm. Complete silence. They were totally hopeless. They were totally yeah. hopeless. Plus... Mm -hmm. You couldn't, you couldn't, you know, be too happy or you would disappear. Mm -hmm. <laughs> wow. Can you believe that? So it was Where really was weird. Bulgaria. In Bulgaria, yeah. when I first went. Yeah. Later on, they became more westernized and all that. I'm talking about right after communism failed. I guess like the modern day would have been North Korea. Yeah, yeah. exactly. You, you don't draw attention. You don't, you know, wear colorful clothes. You don't, you know, laugh too much. Then you become suspicious. My sister was sharing that she had a friend in Romania that grew up when it turned communism. Mm -hmm. And that mm -hmm. people were rich, they had everything, they knew things were changing, they hoarded, they did things, and the government just came in house by house, town by town. Mm -hmm. They saw what you had, they took it. Yeah. If you had a garden, they destroyed your garden and they came back to check to see because they wanted everything equal. If you had animals, pigs, cows, chickens, they took them and then spread it out. So whatever you had, they took. Mm -hmm. So there was, they just robbed you of everything. Yep. Yeah, so, it, that, that's what communism does, is rob people. She was four years old or six, I forget. And she, six years old, she had to get up at four o'clock in the morning. This is Romania? Her, her job was to go to the um, bakery and stand in line or her family would not eat that day. And if the bakery ran out of food, she had to run to the next bakery to mm. get uh, bread or her family would not eat that day. Yeah. No, I believe it. In fact, I was in Romania, you know, right after communism fell. And it used to be a very lush, beautiful country. Well, I had to drive through there. And, um, you had potholes that would have ate your car up. In the book of Revelation, you have something called earth dwellers. And what that is, is people whose home is here on this earth, i.e. people who are not saved. So when you hear that term, you know it refers, it's just like in the book of Ecclesiastes, he uses that term under the sun. 
That means from a secular man's point of view. Okay? So you have to catch up with these terms. So let me get through this. And so we went to the third box in Revelation 6, the famine. Let's see the next thing in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. And in Matthew 24, 7, and there shall be famines. That's the next thing. And pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. And then in Mark 13, 8, and there shall be earthquakes in diverse places, and there shall be famines and troubles. Okay, and in the Luke account, the very next things in great earthquakes should be in diverse places and famines. He's got the same. So, if he's describing the birth pangs, which he does in the very next verse in all three Gospels, he says, and these things are the beginning of, of sorrows, or birth pangs, in Matthew 24, then go 13, where it's yellow. These are the beginning of sorrows. And then he says, and Luke, he doesn't say anything about sorrows. He says, but before all these things, because he takes a different course, remember? He goes back to 70 AD, which is going to, strangely enough, it still parallels all this. Because yeah. history repeats itself. Okay? So the fourth seal in the Revelation 6 um, is death. Verse 7, and he opened the fourth seal, and I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked, behold, a pale horse, and his name is set on it was death. And hell followed with them because hell or Hades is the holding tank for the dead. Okay? Who don't know Christ. And hell fall and power is given unto them in the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword, with hunger, and with death, with the beast of the earth. And then let's go to Matthew. And then they shall deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. Let's go to Mark 13. But take heed to yourself, for they shall deliver you up to councils, and in the synagogues you shall be beaten. Okay, and then Luke 21, notice it's in the synagogues, not in the churches, because the church is out of here. And they shall lay their hands on you, and they shall persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and in prison, and you shall be brought before kings and rulers for my sake. So, Luke still parallels it as we go to the back side. And the last one is you have people under the altar of God in heaven crying out. We call it martyrs. But do you know what the word martyrs mean, where we got that from? I actually have it at the bottom there. Okay, it's martus. We get the word martyr. Witness. It means a witness, and I got the scriptural references there. And because if you are a witness in the early church, guess what happened? You were martyred. You, you were killed. martyred. You died for your faith. So it was kind of synonymous, and, and it will be again. Okay, so. And then we, if you go through the rest of this, you will see martyrs witness on the earth as the next verses in all three Gospels. Okay? Then all three Gospels hit the high point. And Mark, or excuse me, Matthew 24, 15, the abomination of desolation. And Mark 13, 14, the abomination of desolation. And for Luke, it's the destruction of Jerusalem because he's going back. Okay? And then they talk about the wrath of the Lamb, which I would say the birth pains are the first half of the tribulation. When you figure all this out, okay? Just, I mean, just go through it yourself. And I would say that um, the wrath of the Lamb obviously starts in the second half. Okay? After they have to flee to the mountains. Because after they see the abomination and desolation, what did, what did they need to do? Please. You who are in Judea, flee. flee to the mountains. Why? Because great wrath is going to be upon this people. And that's the wrath of the Lamb. So it goes, the birth pains go all through from once the church is raptured, the beginning of the tribulation, all the way to the mid-trip. Then you get the wrath of the Lamb. You see how it kind of lines up? Mm -hmm. So technically speaking, we're not in the birth pains, but we're in the precursor to it. Remember how history repeats itself? I would say we're in a pattern where we have the mild pains compared to what's going to happen. It might seem major but it's nothing compared to what's going to happen. Okay? So, that's where we are. And my main thing is this. Is that God is in complete control. Mm -hmm. He's already told us all this. What did we do? We, what do the Jews call it when we take these scriptures compared to those scriptures? And stringing string pearls. pearls. Yeah, stringing <clears throat> pearls together. That's what we're doing, or connecting the dots, or comparing scripture to scripture, whatever you want to call it. That's what we're doing. We're, come, we're stringing pearls together. We're coming to these conclusions. You can't just look at one scripture and say, yeah, that proves this or whatever. No, you've got to have the whole counsel of God. 
which is what we're doing, okay? Going through it, kind of an overview sense. And then, like I said, once we get into the feast, then you're gonna be blown away, okay? So, any questions? Anybody have any questions? Yes. When are we getting into the feast? Uh, pro <laughs> <laughs> probably, well, I'd say we have a week or two left in, in this stuff. I'm gonna go over this, then we actually will go to Leviticus 23, and we're just going to, first it's going to be cursory views, the feast, just the plain meaning of them and stuff. Then we're going to look deeper and we're going to say, see if we dig deeper into God's word, God says that the feasts are prophetic. He says, and then we, we look at the actual playing out in 1 Corinthians. I call it the 1 Corinthians code. God showed me something. I've never heard anybody do this. We go through 1 Corinthians and there's a pattern there. When you start looking for patterns, you know what I'm mm -hmm, saying? Mm -hmm. it, it just kind of pops out. But I'm telling you, there's a pattern in 1 Corinthians that will blow you away. You won't believe it. Okay? And it will show, and, I mean, people, I mean, when we go to these different depths, we know the Bible was not written by man. Mm -hmm. Couldn't have done it. Mm -hmm. right. Can and possible. Could not have done it. Okay, so as we go deeper into it, that's where we're going to start to head. Like I say, once we start in the feast, try not to miss, because I'm going to build layer upon layer.